Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Uh, yes, we are a webinar. You can call us that. We won't be offended. <laughs> um, but we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians. Uh, the show is free and open to anyone to watch um, our live show or our recorded shows um, on our website. All of our recordings of our previous sessions are all there, so you can go and watch anything if you've missed it. And we do these shows live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. So, um, but then the recordings are there for, for you to watch at your, at your convenience. Um, we do a mixture of things, presentations, interviews, book reviews, mini training sessions, basically anything library related where we'd love to have it on the show. Um, we have guest speakers come in sometimes, and we have Commission Nebraska Library Commission staff sometimes. And this morning we have Commission staff, Sally Snyder, who is our... Um, Coordinator of Children and Young Adult Library Services. Yes. Get that right? Yeah. Very good. <laughs> um, every year she does, oh, well, she has a couple of different um, book review type sessions for us. And um, right now she's got, she's going to tell, tell us about the new books that came out in 2013, almost at the end of the year. She can go back and see what there was um, from kids all the way up to teens. Right. Um, and uh, Sally's show, um, as I said, our show is usually an hour long. Um, but sometimes with so many books that come up, this, does, this, this particular episode has a tendency to run long. So just as a warning, um, it may be longer than an hour in the end. Um, we'll keep going until Sally's done. Um, if you need to leave it after an hour, that's no problem. The whole thing will be recorded and you can always uh, catch up on what you missed later. So um, that's it for my intro. I will hand over to you, Sally. You should be able to control your uh, everything from there. I wanted to say a couple of things before we really get started on the list, and one is that there is a handout available on the Library Commission webpage. I hope you received an email about that. Everyone who registered ahead of time, I emailed that to you yesterday. Great. Um, if you don't have it, it will be included in the show notes afterwards for anyone who didn't register ahead of time. If you're watching this as a recording and you want to have a copy of the list of books in front of you, which I would recommend, you mm -hmm. can go to the Nebraska Library Commission webpage and search in the search box up in the corner for handouts. Mm -hmm. If you, When you do that, the, so far, the top thing that comes up is the list of handouts. That's how that I get I to do. it. <laughs> and the, right now, this, this presentation is the top one. It says Encompass Live. Yeah, Best, uh, Best Youth Books 2013. Yeah. yeah, so you can tell that that's what it is. And so that's to make life easier for you. Um, a couple of things also to mention is you will notice that if you have the list in front of you that a couple, three, four books are from 2012. And that's because generally I work this presentation to be ready for our Nebraska Library Association, Nebraska School Librarians Association conference, which is generally in mid-October. Mm -hmm. So there's a part of the year that we don't catch. And so I bring in a few things from the mm -hmm. past year that I missed because they weren't out yet. And that's why they're on the list in case you were... And, and if you don't like them there, I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's how we go. And also, I apologize. I have a little bit of something going on with a sore throat. But, uh, yes, both but Sally and I have a little head cold throat <laughs> things going on. Um, luckily, you guys are all doing this remotely. You guys are no, of in no danger. <laughs> so we're glad um, about that. <laughs> but, yeah, the two of us. Yeah. Okay, so we'll get started. This is the I start with the children's books, and then I'll do the teen books later. So this is the best new children's books that I have encountered and I get a number of review books from different publishers but not from everybody and not every book of course so there will be things that I haven't seen I do check a lot of books out of the library as well because I hear about them and I'm interested in them so I get some books that way and there are books I haven't gotten my hands on so there if I don't talk about your favorite book I apologize and please email me and tell me what it is because mm -hmm. I don't want to read it <laughs> So we'll get started with best, best new children's books, and of course we'll start with picture books. And uh, I, I'm also going to talk, um, I, have, I have to mention I have a script so that as I go, that keeps me on track and keeps us closer to our hour instead of going so far over. So that's why I'm looking at my script. Monsters Love Colors by Mike Austin. Rambunctious monsters introduce primary colors and combined colors with jumping, dancing, scribbling, squishing, and enthusiasm. <laughs> Lots of energy here, so be sure to have plenty of crayons and paper available after reading this at story time, because they're mm. going to want to do the same thing. Yeah, I can see that becoming messy. <laughs> <laughs> this is a wordless 
Oh, Journey by Aaron Becker is a wordless picture book full of beautiful scenes and wonder. Children will especially love the girl's determination to do the right thing with the help of a red crayon. You can't really tell on her hand they're in the red boat, but she can draw things and then um, they come real. As a child, one of my favorite books was Harold and the Purple Crayon. Yes, so yep. <laughs> this is much more elaborate, of course, than that one was, but it's beautiful. Simple Lang oh, Nightlight by Nicholas Blackman has simple language with wonderful paper cutouts that blend in when the page is turned. So it's very cleverly designed. And as you look at the cover here, the, the two headlights, I think both of them are cut out and you turn the page. But throughout the book, as you turn the page, the cutout part that's show, showing the light through from something blends in with the back of the other page. So it's pretty interesting it's how uh, clever it is. And I think kids will love that. Yeah. Digger and Tom by Sebastian Braun was first published in England. Digger is a hard worker, but he is rather small. One day he finds a rock and starts to work on removing it when, one by one, the other pieces of equipment barge in to try and do the job for him. But it is Digger who finally succeeds. It's a story of persistence and recognizing everybody's worth. And all those trucks and pieces of equipment aren't bad either. This is a book that I added since my, pre I forgot to mention that my presentation in uh, October, I've added a few books mm -hmm. since then because I got a hold of them since then. So, See What a Seal Can Do by Chris Butterworth is blends fiction in the larger type with nonfiction in the smaller type. With a look at the life of a gray seal, how clumsy he looks on land versus how sleek and fast he is in the sea. The end papers show gray and white drawings of 17 other types of seals, and the front and back end papers are different. It's a beautiful look at underwater worlds. Max and the Tag Along Moon by Floyd Cooper. A boy's love for his grandfather has him watching for the moon all the way home. Grandpa told him, that old moon will always shine for you on and on. When clouds cover the moon for a while, Max is disappointed. Maybe Grandpa was wrong. Peck, Peck, Peck by Lucy Cousins. A father teaches his little woodpecker how to peck, and the youngster just can't get enough of it. Watch out when he goes into the house. Listeners will love repeating the frequent refrain of Peck, Peck, Peck. The holes in the cover and the pages in the book show, show where he has pecked, and those will delight listeners. They'll have to look on the pages to see mm -hmm. what has holes in it. It's great fun. Another book about crayons. Mm -hmm. The Day the Crayons Quit by Drew Daywalt. The crayons have each written a letter to Duncan airing their complaints. Red is overworked. Beige is only used to color boring wheat. And black mostly outlines everything. Why can't a balloon be black for a change? Orange and yellow each think that they are the true color of the sun. Duncan finds a solution to make all the crayons happy. It's a fun idea with an open-minded solution. Jasper and Jupe by Oliver Dunray. Two goslings, as it says on the cover, one tidy, one messy. <laughs> Jasper avoids the puddles, Jupe jumps right in as they walk around the farmyard. Until they come across the beehive, then they both run to the pond. At the end of the book, they are, of course, best friends. How to Train a Train by Jason Carter Eaton. This is told as if the train is a pet dog. Teach him how to sit, roll over, fetch, among other things. It's extremely silly and fun, and children will have a ball with this tale. And it's a fun one to, to put in the middle if you're reading um, some books about trains. Oh, If Only by Michael Foreman. Starting with, oh, if only I had stayed home that day, a boy throws a ball for a stray dog, which precipitates a series of disasters and the ongoing lament, oh, if only. Upset cats, birds, parade horses, and more result in a happy ending for the boy and the dog. <clears throat> the Story of Fish and Snail by Deborah Freeman. Fish and Snail live in a storybook. Fish likes to leave that book and explore other books and learn other stories. And then when he comes home, he tells Snail the stories that he's found. One day, stay-at-home Snail considers visiting another book, too. Tuesday by Neil Gaiman is a fun story about a young panda whose parents keep asking if he is going to sneeze.
because his sneezes are monstrous. <laughs> Anticipation is built throughout the story, and the kids will, will read along with you when, when Chu starts to go, ah, 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 <laughs> and then he doesn't sneeze. But what happens when Chu sneezes? It is all conveyed in the art. The Silver Button by Bob Graham. As a girl prepares to put the third and final silver button on her picture of a duck, her brother takes his first step. An ambulance goes by. A soldier hugs his mom. A baby is born and more. The story slowly expands outward with occasional broader views where the reader can still find the first house in the book as they look down on the, on the map-like drawing. A look at one moment in time and all that is happening then. Grumpy Goat by Brett Helquist. The farm is a happy place until Grumpy Goat arrives. One by one the animals say hello, but he chases them away and all he does is eat, eat, eat. One day he sees a beautiful flower and is touched by its brilliant yellow color. He cares for it and sits and watches it. He mellows toward the other animals until the day the flower blows away. He is heartbroken. Listeners may be able to predict what happens next because I think they'll recognize what kind of a flower that is. <laughs> 26 Pirates by Dave Horowitz is a companion book to 2011's 26 Princesses, which I have not seen. Here is a humorous, rhyming alphabet book full of dastardly and not-so-dastardly pirates. Each boy represents a letter, such as, Pirate Owen, where's he going? And Q is Pirate Quaid, not afraid. Hmm. There is also Pirate Lee, needs to pee. <laughs> Their ship, the Sea Princess. And this could spark a careful rhyming of listeners' names in the same rhythm as the book. Mm, just we be all careful know. what you rhyme with. <laughs> <laughs> Two Shy Pandas by Julia Jarman. Two young pandas, Panda and Pandora, live next door to each other, but both of them are too shy to be the first to say hello. They notice what each other are doing, but not when the other one is looking. One snowy day, both of them are worried about the other, if one is sick or maybe they moved away. They soon are hurrying out their front doors to find out if the other is okay. And they finally meet. It's fun, and it's a good look at shyness, particularly for those who are not, to understand a little bit about why or how other people might be shy. My Crocodile Does Not Bite by Joel Kulka. Joel Kulka, excuse me. It's pet show day at the school, and Ernest is bringing his very large crocodile. But don't worry, his crocodile does not bite. Cindy Lou, a bossy show-off, insists that her poodle will win the day. Fifi can do the, all the tricks a crocodile can. She just doesn't feel like it right now. Gustav is an upbeat, jovial fellow and is well-trained. After the final insult from Cindy Lou, Gustav does swallow her whole. He didn't bite. He swallowed her whole. No worries, on the last page, page, Gustav is riding a unicycle and juggling Cindy Lou, Fifi, and a tennis ball. So all is well at the end. The Green Bath by Margaret Mayhe is great fun. The new green bathtub takes the boy down to the sea, then across it racing a sea serpent to find pirates and treasure. This is one of Margaret Mayhe's last books because she passed away, I believe, in March of this year. Hmm. Cowpolk Clyde and Dirty Dog by Lori Mortensen. Cowpolk Clyde is all cleaned up after a hard day of work, but Dog is still dirty. How can Cowpolk Clyde get Dog in the bathwater? He tries a number of things mm -hmm. before finally and ultimately he is successful. And the kids will just love what he does. <laughs> up the Creek by Nicholas Old, Oldland. Moose, Beaver, and Bear have been in, I think, two other books before this I haven't seen. But in this one, they're learning about working together and what happens when everyone wants to go their own way. Like with canoeing, if everyone's paddling their own direction, you do not get anywhere. And they figure that out rather quickly. <laughs> and they do have some uh, experiences along the way. It's, it's great fun. The Tortoise and the Hare by Jerry Pinkney. This is one of his interpretations of fairy tales and folk tales. And the beautiful illustrations add to this straightforward retelling. It, this one, you can't tell so much from the cover, but it's set in the American Southwest, and it's also beautiful. He recently also did Puss in Boots, if you haven't mm. seen that one. Truck Stop by Ann Rockwell. Trucks start pulling in even before sunrise. This is a look at the life of a boy who helps his parents at the truck stop counter every morning before he goes to school. But one morning, he knows something is wrong, and he's the only one who notices, 
and says they have to do something. And the many different types of trucks will, of course, draw readers to the book. Oh, I love this book. Yeah. Exclamation mark by Amy Krauss Rosenthal. Everyone else he knows is a period or a dot. Exclamation mark feels left out, unnecessary, weird, and jobless. He just doesn't fit in with the others. The only time he really feels comfortable is when he's laying on his side so he doesn't stick out up so much. Then question mark comes along and starts asking him question after question after question <laughs> until finally he yells, stop! And then he finds his place in the world. <laughs> I think it's a terrific way to teach a little bit about punctuation in a fun story, so take a look at that. Perfectly Percy by Paul Schmid. The best thing in the world are balloons, at least to Percy. But when you are a porcupine, balloons are problematic. He thinks and thinks to try and find an idea that will allow him to have a balloon without accidentally popping it. Good luck, Percy. This is a good reminder that finding a solution can take time, do not give up too soon, because he does figure out something. Your Pajamas Are Showing by Michael Lee Schmidt. This is the first book in the Where's Leopold series, and it's translated from the French. One day, Leopold is able to disappear. He never had before, but now he can. He uses it to harass his older sister, Celine. She's about two years older. She can hold her own, but he also helps her with some bully girls at school. The comic book format will appeal to the target audience of grades 1 to 3. It's a, there's a little bit of potty humor included, but not too overwhelming. And book 2, Snowball Truce, came out in August. <gasps> Bugs in My Hair by David Shannon. This is an imaginative story of a boy whose mother finds he has head lice. Outrageous illustrations express the boy's feelings uh, about what's in his hair and what they might be doing and also tells about how they get rid of them. It's a must-have for libraries, and I think now he needs to do one about bed bugs. Mm, that's Oof. a big thing now, yes. That's another big thing. <laughs> the Dark by Lemony Snicket. A boy is afraid of the dark, especially in the basement. But one night, his night light has burned out. The dark visits him in his room and asks him to come with it so it can show him something. It's a clever use of black space, especially as the boy uses his flashlight. Hmm. And it's a, a, a calm story, not a scary story, actually. That's good. As Fast as Words Could Fly by Pamela M. Tuck. In the 1960s, Mason Steele, who was 14, takes notes at his father's, and of his father's concerns after the civil rights meetings that he attends. And then he handwrites business letters for his father. The group buys him a typewriter, and he works hard to learn how to use it. At the end of the summer, Mason and his two older brothers learn they will all attend Belvoir High instead of the all-black school. They face a lot of discrimination, but when Mason proves his typing skills to the school librarian, he has an after-school job. Then he hears about the citywide typing tournament. Could he represent Belvoir High? This is a fictional story based on a true story that's revealed in the author's note. Oh, and David Wisner has Mr. Waffles. This is another new book to the list. Mr. Waffles ignores all his cat toys to his owner's dismay. But one toy catches his eye. It turns out to be a small spaceship with beings aboard who must now try to make repairs without attracting Mr. Waffles' attention. This is clever and fun, and the ants and the ladybug and some other animals that apparently, small animals like that, apparently mm. Mr. Waffles terrorizes they help the aliens to get away. Beginning readers and early chapter books. Um, I'll start with Pinch and Dash and the Terrible Couch. Michael J. Daly has written this one. It's his second book about friends, Pinch and Dash. Here, Pinch is enjoying reading in his snug chair in his cozy room when the movers arrive with his aunt's bright red couch and cram it into his cozy room. It doesn't fit. Nothing works right. Pinch is unhappy, but Dash thinks he can make it all work if he just moves a few more things around. Eventually, Pinch comes up with a solution. One's per one person's trash is another one's treasure. Bink and Golly, Best Friends Forever by Kate DiCamillo and Allison McGee. The third book about two best friends again contains three stories. The first story is Golly's realization that she is royalty. We don't know how she comes to this conclusion, but she is certain that it's true. 
The second book is Fink grappling with the fact that she is much shorter than Golly. And the third involves their efforts to start a collection in order to get their photo in Flickr's Arcana, think Guinness Book of World Records. It's another great look at the ups and downs of friendship. And I heard, I heard this might be the last book about Fink and Golly, so heads up on that. <clears throat> Dodsworth in Tokyo by Tim Egan. This continues the series, which takes a look at major cities of the world. Dodsworth so far has been in New York, London, Paris, and Rome. This time, Dodsworth and the duck are in Tokyo. But trouble continues to follow the duck. As the readers are laughing at the situations, they are also learning a bit about the city. It's clever and fun. The second book about Bramble and Maggie, titled Horse Meets Girl, by Jesse Haas. It finds them working through compromise, so neither one of them is always the boss. Bramble also becomes bored quickly when everyone has gone to work or school, so she causes some disturbances. The neighbor has an unexpected contribution to the situation. This is another fun chapter book for horse fans. Penny and Her Marble by Kevin Hankies. Penny finds a beautiful blue marble in Mrs. Goodwin's yard, and she takes it home without asking anyone. But soon guilt begins to gnaw at her, because she knows it wasn't in her yard, it was in her neighbor's yard, and it might be something they've been looking and looking for. Yeah. And she tries to decide what she should do. Ling and Ting Share a Birthday by Grace Lynn. The second book about the twins, Ling and Ting, subtly shows us their personalities through their preparations for and celebration of their birthday. Baking a birthday cake and shopping for a gift for their sister are among the six chapters in this beginning reader title. As it says in the first book, Ling and Ting are not the same. The Meanest Birthday Girl by Josh Schneider. It's her birthday and Dana has called Anthony an Igaborse, pinched him, and eaten his dessert at lunch. Still, he gives her a birthday present. Oh, what a present. A white elephant, literally. <laughs> Dana soon has more than she can handle. And this is by the 2012 Theodore Seuss Geisel Award winner for Tales for Very Picky Years. And this was great fun because uh, she kind of got what she deserved. But she begins to uh, realize her errors. Picture book, nonfiction picture book titles include Seahorses by Jennifer Keats Curtis. Beautifully illustrated, this tells the life cycle of the seahorse, how they collect food, avoid predators, and reproduce. It does include an illustration of impregnation, but not much is the visible, in case you were worried about that. Isn't Seahorse is the one where the males care for the babies, yes. too? Yeah. yeah. Noah Webster and His Words by Jerry Chase Ferris is a picture book biography of the man who first compiled the English language into an American dictionary with American spellings. His road to this event is fascinating. He studied 20 languages in order to give the origin of the words listed. Finally published in 1828, his American Dictionary of the English Language became the second most popular book ever printed in English after the Bible. Occasionally, words used in telling his story are defined in parentheses, such as Yale was expensive, adjective, having a high price or costly. It includes important dates in his life and in the, in the life of our country. And a final note, more about Noah Webster, are all at the back of the book. So full of information. Patricia McLaughlin and Emily McLaughlin Cherist have written Cat Talk, 13 poems of cats talking about themselves, their likes or dislikes, and they vary from straightforward to humorous to tender. We get a quick look at what makes each cat who he or she is. Beautiful watercolor illustrations complement the text. The Long, Long Journey, The Godwit's Amazing Migration by Sandra Markle. Hatched in Alaska, the bar-tailed godwit feeds on beetles, spiders, larvae, and other things before flying non-stop to New England for the winter, the longest such migration recorded so far. The information is conveyed in a conversational tone and will be useful for reports as well as its appeal to animal lovers wondering about this amazing bird. The cut paper and watercolor illustrations enhance the text. And, of course, there's an author's note at the back of the book with a little more information, which I really appreciate because uh, they make the story good, and then mm -hmm. they give you that extra information. So you know, you where, yeah, where, where the reality and where it all came from. Yes. yes. 
Then the kids can learn more. They can they want can. to find out more about it, maybe. And then they can even look up more in, in other books. The Long, Long, Oops, Miss Moore Thought Otherwise by Jan Pinborough and Carol Moore and how she, among others, was determined to have room for children in the public library. And she did not take no for an answer. This does imply, though, that in the, in, until the author's note, this does imply that she was the only one. And in the author's note, the um, people recognized that other uh, women were also working for the same thing. But Miss Moore is one person who really worked hard for that. Fiction for grades two to five or so, because I don't think I mentioned this before, but my grade groupings are kind of general, mm -hmm. like the book review sources do. We know that some children read ahead of what we would call their, their mm -hmm. grade level, and some not as fast. So this is a general look at things. Doll Bones by Holly Black. Zach, Poppy, and Alice, all 12, have been playing a fantasy game for years with action figures and other items. But suddenly, Zach announces he won't play anymore, though he really wants to. Poppy tells them both that she has been seeing and talking with the ghost of the dead girl whose bones were used to make the delicate china doll in her grandmother's china cabinet. They must go on their final quest to bury the doll in the girl's empty grave. It's a little bit creepy, but it's uh -huh. a chance to right a wrong. And it's by Holly Black, so... We're familiar with her. Mm -hmm. So you know what you're getting. <laughs> right. But again, this is for grades two to five, so not as... Oh, Flora and Ulysses by Kate DiCamillo. After a squir squirrel is run over by a runaway vacuum, Flora, a self-described self natural-born cynic, <laughs> applies CPR and revives him. Naming him Ulysses, they are inseparable, even as her mother works behind the scenes to end this friendship. Her parents have separated, and Flora survives by reading the comic books she loves about the amazing Incandesto, which also include a short in each one called Terrible Things Can Happen to You. She has studied every one of those to be sure she is ready for any kind of terrible thing that might come along. Ulysses, after his, his uh, experience in the vacuum, finds that he can type and write poetry, and also that he is a hero when needed. Great fun and uh, numerous illustrations through the book. Nikki and Deja, Substitute Teacher by Karen English is, I believe, the fifth book in the series. The classroom gets a substitute, Mr. Willow, when their favorite teacher breaks her ankle. Nikki and Deja are both uncomfortable when Mr. Willow lets things go and does not insist the students behave the way Miss Shelby orbits would. Then Mr. Willow is replaced by Mr. Blaggart, who operates on the other end of the spectrum. He takes no guff and has the class run each morning. Will things ever go back to normal? This is a little bit more didactic than her other books, but I think that readers will be interested in the look at sub substitutes mm -hmm. and how one can be on the easy side and another can be on the much more tough side. The Odd Squad, Bully Bait by Michael Fry. Nick, 12, spends a lot of time in his locker since Bully Roy loves to put him there. The school counselor decides Nick and outcast Molly should join Carl in the safe, safety patrol. Carl is currently the only member, something Nick is adamantly against. Still, there are advantages to someone having your back. And in a side story, is the ghost of Emily Dickinson really haunting the school and pulling pranks? <laughs> Numerous illustrations help to break up the text, and this is the first of a, of a new series. The humor and wacky situations will appeal to our wimpy kid fans. Neil Gaiman, Fortunately, the Milk. A wacky story of a father's quick trip to the store to buy some milk for his children's breakfast. Upon his return, he recounts an incredible story of what happened while he was out. Aliens, a stegosaurus flying a hot air balloon, pirates, the time-space continuum, and so much more were involved. Fortunately, the milk is usually safe. <laughs> Lots of black and white illustrations are included. Very wacky. Ginger Snap by Patricia Riley Giff tells of Jaina, who's 11. Her nickname is Ginger Snap, and her older brother Rob. They just got back together after living in foster homes due to their parents' deaths in a car accident. It is almost the end of World War II. The war in Europe is over, but Rob has enlisted, and he is on one of many ships in the Pacific. When he is reported as missing in action, that prompts Ginger Snap to run away to Brooklyn and look for the lady who might be her grandmother. 
It's a quiet story of seeking and finding home. Welcome to the Tribe is Tibid Tum Tum number, number One by Grimaldi. This is noted as a reprint edition, but I can't find when it first came out. I've looked in several. I did not look in World Cat yet, so I'm, I'm not as <laughs> thorough as I should have been. That's a, the cave people families all know that dinosaurs disappeared, disappeared ages before humans came along, so no one believes Tib when he says he has found one and it is friendly. Many adventures later, the people do, find, do finally see Tum Tum, and they aren't sure he should stick around. This is a graphic novel with full-color panels, panels and plenty of fun. The Worm Whisperer by Betty Hicks. Every year the town has a woolly worm race up a string, and this year maybe Ellis Coffey, he's in fifth grade, maybe his year to win. His family needs the prize money for his dad's back operation for the deductible. He has found a woolly worm, woolly worm that seems to listen to him and is willing to learn. Ellis loves all animals, and he really cares for his woolly worm, Tink. When she is lost, Ellis has to try with a new worm that doesn't even know him. Can his new worm win the $1,000 prize? The Truth of Me by Patricia McLaughlin. Robbie loves to visit his grandmother, and this trip he finds more than he expected. His grandmother always tells him stories of the wild animals in the nearby woods, but this trip he gets to go with her to see them. And at this point, a bit of magical realism comes into the story thread with the animals. There's a side story about how Robbie feels his parents act like they don't care about him, and his grandmother tells him something that happened in the past that is the root of this feeling. It's about families, love, and the best we can do. Lulu and the Dog from the Sea is a second book about Lulu. A week at the beach sounds wonderful, like a wonderful vacation for Lulu, her best friend Nellie, and Lulu's parents. But right away they are warned about the thieving dog from the sea. He steals, he knocks trash cans over, and he is too rambunctious. But Lulu doesn't see a troublemaker. She sees a hungry, lonely dog. Nancy Clancy's Secret Admirer is book two of this new series about Fancy Nancy for a little bit older readers. This is by Jane O'Connor. Nancy and her best friend Jojo still have their mystery club, but Valentine's Day is drawing near and they decide they need to secretly help babysitter Annie find love with Nancy's guitar teacher, Andy. Numerous illustrations will be enjoyed by the readers. There's a third book that just came out in November in this series, and now I can't remember the title, but you could look for that too. I haven't read it yet. Timmy Failure, Mistakes Were Made by Stephen Pastis. <laughs> Timmy, 11, has a detective agency, but contrary to his beliefs, he is not good at following clues. His partner, an imaginary polar bear, usually makes things worse. With illustrations on every page, this is again reminiscent of Diary of a Wimpy Kid with a more clueless main character. <laughs> Likely to be more since this is marked as book one. The Daring Escape of the Misfit Menagerie by Jacqueline Resnick. Shades of bad treatment a la Road Doll or Lemony Snicket. Bertie 10 is forced to help his uncle by caring for their circus animals and doing every other dirty job around the place. When his uncle tricks another man and acquires his four remarkable animals, Bertie and the new acrobat Sir Susan, who's close in age to Bertie, end up engineering a possible escape. The Sasquatch Escape by Susan Selfers is book one in a new series called The Imaginary Veterinarian. Ben 10 is sent to spend the summer with his grandfather, whose idea of fun is pudding day at the senior center. <laughs> now we're talking. His grandfather's cat catches something that looks a bit like a bat, but is it a baby dragon? He then meets local girl Pearl, and soon they are having an amazing summer. They have they um, accidentally let the Sasquatch out, and now they have to bring him back to the secret headquarters. And they have to follow the instructions in a Sasquatch capture kit. It's great fun, and it's followed up by The Lonely Lake Monster, which is book two in the series. In this story, they um, end up encountering the lake monster when they shouldn't have been over by the pond. Mm -hmm. And the lake monster is lonely, and he grabs Ben and, and takes Ben to the little island in the pond so that Ben can't escape. All he knows is that he's lonely, so they have to help the lake monster. 
My Life as a Cartoonist by, Tash, by Janet Tashian. This is the third book, I believe, about um, Derek, who's 12. In this one, he is up against new kid Umberto, who is in a wheelchair. Umberto steals the limelight and Derek's comic book ideas while maintaining an innocent air to the teachers. When Derek tries to defend himself, the teachers think he is bullying Umberto. Derek is working hard to improve his cartooning skills, but also Umberto outshines him there too. As in the previous books, the stick figures in the margins illustrate the meaning of the more difficult words. This is something Derek does to learn and remember the words. The third book in the series that again will appeal to wimpy kid fans because we all know how we need other books that will appeal to them. They <laughs> read through them so fast. Mm -hmm. Tommy Soros by Doug Tindapel is a graphic novel about a boy whose dog is hit by a car and killed. He goes to spend some time with his grandfather, and then he discovers a Tyrannosaurus Rex on the property. It eventually he eventually realizes it is his dog Tommy come back to him in a different form. And uh, mm -hmm. eventually the... The town people, the nearby town people, discover that he does have this Tyrannosaurus Rex, and they're not sure it should stick around either. <laughs> people are so picky. Stick Dog by Tom Watson is a humorous tale of a group of dogs who plot to steal the hamburgers from, the, from a family enjoying their picnic. Stick Dog is the leader, and he is very tolerant of the less usable ideas from his friends. Eventually, after many side trips and discussions, they have a better day than they ever imagined. <coughs> the second book about Stick Dog and his friends, Stick Dog Wants a Hot Dog by Tom Watson. Stick Dog and his four friends want to snitch some hot dogs from Pe Peter's Frankfurters, a cart wafting yummy smells across the neighborhood. As usual, some sidetracking occurs and Stick Dog is wondering if his hum hungry tummy will ever get something to digest. And if the raccoons get there first, there may be nothing left for the dogs. Hmm disaster. Nonfiction for grades two to five or so include Revolutionary Friends by Celine Castrovilla. This is a brief look at the friendship between General George Washington and the Marquis de Lafayette. It also includes a little bit about the effects Lafayette had on the Revolutionary War and uh, mentions that when Lafayette was, was shot and injured, General Washington told his surgeons Take care of him as if he is my son. So they really had a good friendship. Hoop Genius, the subtitle, How a Desperate Teacher in a Rowdy Gym Class Invented <laughs> Basketball, really tells you what this book is, the whole thing. It's by John Coy. The inve invention of basketball came from a teacher hoping to channel the energy and competitive spirit of the young men in the gym class he has taken over. They are bored with calisthenics and gymnastics, so James Naismith must find a way to keep them in line and control their energy. Picture book nonfiction that gives the basics of the story, and what, another thing that's fun is the end papers contain a reproduction of the first draft of the rules of the game. Hmm. Nice. Wild Animal Neighbors Sharing Our Urban World by Ann Downer is a look at eight animals that have, or are trying to, for instance the cougar, find homes in cities. This title explores the problems and notes some of the innovative solutions that are being tried to help both animals and humans. It's an appealing format with plenty of photographs and includes an index and bibliography. Cowboy Up, Ride the Navajo Rodeo by Nancy Bo Flood. The book's design is appealing. Poetry on one page and nonfiction text on the other with one photo or more on each page talks about getting ready and being involved in a rodeo. The announcer's palaver is included once the rodeo begins. It's a celebration of the Navajo people and of the rodeo and includes a page of rodeo history at the back of the book noting the care taken of all the rodeo animals. Miracle Mud by David A. Kelly. Russell Aubrey Lena Blackburn was a major league ball player, but not an exceptional one. He did, however, make the Hall of Fame in a way for discovering a special mud that is still used to take the shine off of baseballs. In 1938, he began to sell it to the other teams. This picture book biography tells the story of his baseball playing, coaching, and solving the problems of the shine on new baseballs. It's an unusual topic that will attract baseball and sports fans and includes a two-page spread of additional information at the back of the book. I never heard about this mud and about the problem, so that no. was fascinating. Facebugs. 
Facebook by J. Patrick Lewis has 15 <laughs> poems with additional information at the back of the book. And it includes a photo of each bug's face and some cartoon type drawings on each page. <laughs> How can you miss with that? Hey Charleston by Ann Rockwell. And I, you can't see the subtitle, and of course I didn't write it down. True story. Um, true story of the Jenkins, Jenkins Orphan Orphanage Band. Thank you. The Jenkins Orphanage Band was formed by Reverend Daniel Joseph Jenkins in the late 1800s to earn money to support the orphans. This is how the Charleston dance and the music called Rag originated, paving the way for more musical changes to come. And uh, there's a little bit more to it than that in the book. They went. They were invited to England to perform, and while they were in England, World War II, World War One basically started, and there were a number of Americans that were stranded in London because their money was in British banks, and that was frozen during the duration. So the money that the band had made, they loaned to the people who were stuck there so they could all get back to the U.S., which is a pretty amazing nice. story, too, kind of at the back of the second half of the book. Something to Prove by Robert, Robert Skade. As it says on the front book jacket flap, in 1936, the New York Yankees wanted to test a hot prospect named Joe DiMaggio to see if he was ready for the big leagues. They knew just the ball player to call, Satchel Paige, the best pitcher anywhere, black or white, is um, the front and papers. And there's a quote on the back of the book which says, Joe DiMaggio stated, the best and fastest pitcher I ever faced, <laughs> Satchel Paige. And this is just about that one game. Mm -hmm. And now we move on to team books. On your list, you'll see some a list of some of the uh, new books in series. So I, I jumped over talking about those to make time for everything. Mm -hmm. So that's just a way for me to let you know something new has come out in a particular series you might be keeping track of. Okay, we'll start with fiction for younger teens. Nobody by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. Claire is 16 and has, she has spent her life reminding her parents and everyone else that she is there. They just tend to forget. One day, looking out her window, she sees a boy, that's Nix, he's 17, aiming a rifle at her. He is stunned that she sees him. He is a nobody like her and has been trained as an assassin, but now he questions why the Institute has sent him after her. She is no threat to anyone. There's a bit of magic in, in with the idea that some people are completely evil, some are normal, and some are forgettable. Strike Three, You're Dead by Josh Burke. This is listed as Lenny and the Mike series, book one. Hmm. Lenny Norbeck is about 12, and his two best friends, both named Mike, are spending the summer taking it easy until a new player for their Phillies team falls down dead on the pitching mound. Huh. Now they plan to solve the mystery of what happened to him. Jinx by Sage Blackwood. If you stay on the path, you will stay alive. The Irwald forest surrounds Jinx's home and everyone knows to stay out of it. A wizard appears and buys Jinx as his stepfather is abandoning him, which means certain death, in the forest. As he grows up, he is curious about the wizards, Simon, his workroom, that he is never supposed to enter. Hmm. And how long do you think that goes? <laughs> Doesn't last very long, huh? <laughs> he figures out how to get in there. Oh, yeah, then there's some more trouble. <laughs> the Raft by S.A. Bodine. Robbie is 15 and is a passenger on the delivery plane to the Midway Atoll where she lives with her parents when a storm causes them to crash. Now she is trying to survive in a life draft. This book will be a popular choice with teens due to the survival aspect, mm -hmm. along with the specific knowledge Robbie has from living on Midway such as the danger of disease from fish living on the edge of the islands. I didn't know that. I would have tried to catch the fish and eat them and then... <laughs> yeah, then it would have been, it been over for you. <laughs> um, this is a tough story because she has very little and every time you think something good might happen, no, it turns out to be worse. So it's a tough story. Etiquette and Espionage by Gail Carriger. This is the first book in her new series aimed at teens called Finishing School. Set in the same world as her Parasol Protectorate series, but in a slightly earlier time period, we meet Sophronia, 14, who was always in the midst of kerfuffles and disturbances. Her latest stunt has landed her in a finishing school. But while she does learn a proper curtsy, dancing, and other expected things, she is also learning eavesdropping and diversion. Hmm. She is soon investigating on her own the location of a vital missing item. 
Could she have found her proper place? And book two, Curtsies and Conspiracies, came out last month. I haven't had a chance ah. to read it yet. So, Pinned by Sharon Flake, ninth grader Autumn's goal is to be the best wrestler, and she is well on her way. Adonis, also in ninth grade, is focusing on academics. He is gifted and has the brains and the concentration to go far. He is in a wheelchair, born without legs. Told in their alternating voices, Autumn, who has trouble reading, is determined to convince Adonis he wants her in his life. And all he wants is for her to leave him alone. If I Ever Get Out of Here by Eric Gansworth. Did, this takes place in the 1970s. Um, Lewis uh, is a, a member of the Tuscarora Indian group and he lives on the reservation in upstate New York but he does attend a white school in town, along with some of the other teenagers from the reservation. Hmm. However, he is in the seventh grade in the top group, and he is the only Indian in that top group. So he feels bullied, feels like an outsider, um, a number of, of things. And then George Haddonfield comes to town. His father is in the Air Force, and they have just moved to town. His father's at the base nearby. And George doesn't care about Indian, white, and all that kind of stuff. He just kind of thinks Lewis is fun. So they mm -hmm. get together. This includes the Beatles, Paul McCartney and Wings, um, a big blizzard, a road trip, lots of things going on. Prisoner B 3087 by Alan Grants is a fictional account of a true story. Yannick was 11 when Germany took over Krakow. 12 when the wall to keep the Jews in the ghetto was built, and his bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah at 13 was held secretly and quietly in an abandoned basement. He is eventually transferred to 10 different concentration camps, somehow continuing to survive. It's an amazing story. In a completely different tone, <laughs> Charlie Joe Jackson's Guide to Summer Vacation by Tommy Greenwald is the third book about Charlie Joe Jackson. He is in middle school and he hates to read. He goes to Camp Rita Bookie, which is a lot like summer school to him. He is a little lost among the group of nerds he finds there, even though two of his best friends are there. While he is definitely not in his element, Charlie Joe does find he has something to contribute. Cold Town Jesus by Ron Corchy, told in free verse Walker, 14, and his mother are grieving the death of his older brother Noah. Not long after Walker prays for help for his mother, Jesus walks into his bedroom. Walker isn't sure if Jesus is really there or is a manifestation of his mental situation, but as time goes by, things slowly begin to improve. Only Walker and a stray dog seem able to see Jesus, who throws Walker items such as, Can we take a walk or something? Jesus asked. Your mother's heart is breaking. I'm very sensitive to people's suffering. Why don't you do something about it? Why don't you? Some may think it is sacrilegious since Jesus is portrayed at times as a smart aleck and a regular guy, but as this short book goes on, his approach becomes clear. Oh yes, and Jesus does ask for some red tennis shoes, so hence the oh. cover. He wants to be cool, dude. Yeah. They're comfortable. Yeah. The Hypnotist by Gordon Corman. Um, Jack, Jack's opus. He's 12. He is dis finds he has descended from two powerful hypnotist bloodlines. But he has just begun to realize that he can control other people's actions with some frightening results, especially when the head of the Sencha Institute has plans for Jax's abilities. Hmm. Is the Sencha Institute really a good place? Mm. <laughs> and I have a feeling that there's going to be more books about the hypnotists. Scarlet by Marissa Meyer is book two in the Lunar Chronicles series. Cinder Kai and Scarlet stories alternate. Scarlet lives on a vegetable farm in France. Her grandmother has disappeared and the police have given up. An accidental meeting with Wolf, a street fighter, sets her on a course to search for her grandmother. Meanwhile, Cinder is trying to escape from prison and Kai can see no way to avoid marrying the Lunar Queen, Lavana. There's plenty of mystery and action that continues to move the story forward. And uh, books three and four are going to come out February 2014 and the last one in 2015, according to information I have at this time, <laughs> though we know sometimes things change. Mm -hmm. The Runaway King by Jennifer A. Nielsen is sequel to The False Prince, which is book two, and this is book two in the trilogy. Jaron, 14, chooses to flee the castle in secret, hoping it will help him keep the throne. 
Carthia is threatened by pirates and possibly by a neighboring country. Jaren is gambling that he will be able to stop the pirate threat being outside of the castle. To me, this series reads like the Ranger's Apprentice series, so anybody mm. asking for more like the Ranger's Apprentice, hand them these two books right away. Road Trip by Gary and Jim Paulson. This is told by Ben, who's 14, and the family's Border Collie, Atticus. They're on their way to rescue a Border Collie puppy. Ben and his father are working through some issues, and they also help and are helped by others they pick up along the way. It, this has humor and heart, and it's also a short book. So somebody looking for a not very long read will enjoy that. Ship Out of Luck. Be careful how you say this. <laughs> Ship Out of Luck by Neil Schusterman. Nancy and his family are coerced into joining Mr. Crawley and Lexi for a seven-day cruise. Trouble still follows Nancy, because how could it be his fault? These <laughs> things that happen. Soon he is enmeshed in an international incident, and he is possibly guilty of a federal offense. Nancy has heart for the troubles of others and continues to try to help where he can. Again, lots of humor. Navigating Early by Claire Vanderpool. Jack, 13, is sent from Kansas to a boarding school in Maine. There he befriends early Auden, a strange boy who was fascinated with the number pi and believes it is telling him a story. He also believes his brother is still alive after World War II and following the story will, will help find him. The boys take a rowboat and go on a quest into the mountains during a week of school vacation. Danger and adventure await them. Pivot Point by Casey West when her parents announce they are divorcing in Addie, Addison, a high school junior, she will need to choose whether to live with her mother in the place she has always lived or with her father who is moving outside the protected compound where those with special ability, abilities can use them freely. Addie is able to look six weeks into the future to see the two different paths she could take and what will happen with each choice. And then she has a tough decision to make about what she's actually going to do. Some nonfiction for teens, The Nazi Hunters by Neil Boscombe. The subtitle says it all, how a team of spies and survivors captured the world's most notorious Nazi. Adolf Eichmann escaped and lived for years in Argentina after World War II ended. Boya describes this title as a spy story with an evil genius and zealous advocates seeking justice. I think that pretty much says it. <laughs> yeah. It is amazing to me that the search was discontinued more than once due to rumors not being worth following and lack of photographic evidence that Eichmann was living where reported. Hmm. But again, they eventually do catch they do, him. Yeah. And they have photos of the time uh, in the book, so oh, nice. that also helps really tell the story. Andrew Jenks, My Life as a Young Filmmaker by Andrew Jenks. His family moved to Belgium when he was nine years old, and he was lost until his mom bought a video camera to send tapes back to the States. Andrew spent all his spare time with the camera. They returned to New York when he was in sixth grade, but he still kept taping anything and everything. He uses a scrapbook approach to tell his story, using many photos, plenty of white space along with the text. It's sure to appeal to teens familiar with his show and or interested in life after high school and college. Because he does talk about how he spent two years at film, film school in New York, but that mm -hmm. wasn't working for him. And then he, that's when he decided to go off and do his, his film about the, the documentary about living with the nursing home people. Mm -hmm. Zombie Makers, oh, True yeah. Stories of Nature's Undead by Rebecca L. Johnson tells of animals, mostly bugs, in nature that inject other creatures who then no longer act in their own best interest. In effect, they are zombies. After each example is explained, the author includes a brief science behind the story explained by scientists and or university professors. It's fascinating and icky, and there might be some in your house. Oh, oh I least, know that. <laughs> the author found some in her house. Oh, they were flies. Yeah. They were in the attic. Light on the Prairie by Nancy Plain is um, uh, the subtitle, Solomon Butcher, photographer of Nebraska's pioneer days. This includes some Nebraska history along with a biography of Solomon Butcher, at least during his time living in Nebraska. So this primarily, of course, focuses on Nebraska, but the the photographs are well known across the country by him, and it really gives a sense of the life at that time, and it's mm -hmm. wonderful to have this all together in one book. And this also won the nonfiction um, award for, wait, Nebraska Center for the Book. Oh, 
Youth Book Awards. Gulp by Mary Roach. Adventures on the Alimentary Canal. Now, this doesn't sound very interesting, just, but it's fascinating. It's by Mary Roach. Did I say that? Mm -hmm. Amazing stories of research, happenstance, and the workings of the human digestive tract. It is an adult book, or it was marketed as adult, but it's sure to interest teens, especially with sections such as spit, gas, and fecal transplants. And any of the teens who have read is. her earlier books like Stiff are going to see her name and say, oh yeah, I want to see what she has to say here. Bomb by Stephen Scheinken. Um, he tells of the Manhattan Project and the scientists from other nations who assisted. There are also a little bit of discussion of how some nations, like Russia, were hoping to steal the secrets of the bomb. It includes attempts to thwart the Nazi scientists who were attempting to develop a similar bomb and the aftermath after the bomb was used. Mm -hmm. And this book received the Excellence in Nonfiction Award. It was a Newbery Honor Award and a Cybert Honor book. So it's definitely something you need in your collection. For the Good of Mankind by Vicki Oransky Wittenstein. This is sickening, but it's likely to catch teens' attention. The author discusses a number of cases starting in the 1700s of experiments on unknowing patients to learn more about what the human body can stand. In the late 1700s, Edward Jenner introduced the cowpox virus, then later the smallpox virus on young children's arms, and included his own son, to prove the former could save lives, and it's unclear whether he had permission to do this with the other mm -hmm. children or not. Mm -hmm. So this book also discusses the development of laws to protect people from this kind of uh, action. It's included this. Bad Girls by Jane Yolen and Heidi E. Y. Stemple, her daughter, is a look at some of the bad women of history, 26 ladies in 24 chapters. Each chapter focuses on one or two ladies who were very bad, or were they coerced, or foolish, or controlled. Jane Yolen and her daughter offer the basic details as we know them in text, and then, in a little one-page graphic novel format, debate each case as to, was she really bad? Did so somebody else exert pressure? Mm -hmm. This will likely inspire some readers to find out more about some of the women, Delilah, Lizzie Borden, Mata Hari, and Barney, Bonnie Parker, to name a few. Now we'll go on to fiction for older teens. The Coldest Girl in Cold Town by Holly Black. Tana is 17. Her, her ex-boyfriend, Aiden, and vampire Gabriel, who was found chained to a bed, travel to the nearest cold town, the walled city of vampires, to try to save Aiden from becoming a vampire. He's been bitten, but he hasn't changed yet. And the book explains how this process works. I didn't think another vampire book could be into This is fascinating. <laughs> and I don't know. There might be it's more. It's nice if they can come from a different angle or yes. do something different with it, yes. Definitely comes from a different angle. <laughs> the Diviners by Libba Bray. Evie is sent to New York to live with her uncle after she embarrasses the son of an Ohio small-town big shot. She loves her punishment and spends some time in speakeasies downing the booze. This takes place during the 20s, 1920s. She loves her punishment. The supernatural is everywhere in this book. Evie has a talent to see the past lives of objects. And her uncle runs the Museum of American Folklore, Superstition, and the Occult. But now there is a bloody killer on the loose with no clues as to who may be next. He could be an evil spirit. Evie is determined to find out. Book two just came out in August, titled Diviner's Curse, and Lair of Dreams, book three, will be out next April. So, more to read. Killer of Enemies by Joseph Bruchok. Part Apache and part Abenaki, Lauren, 17, is skilled in killing the giant genetically engineered monsters that roam the countryside. Now that the cloud has caused most machinery to quit, the world is a different place. Her mother, brother, and sister are being held by the four heads of Haven, the former prison now being used to keep the monsters out and the slaves in. If Lozen can continue to survive, she plans to eventually free her family. That's, this, this really reads like the others of Joseph Bouchon. Mm -hmm. Lots of Adventure, action, and really pulls you forward in this story. 
The Elite is a sequel to the selection by Kira Cass. 35 girls were chosen for the selection for Prince Max and Demi to get to know and eventually choose a wife to later be queen. Now in this book, The Elite, there are only six left and they are called, the six of them, The Elite. Main character America Singer is still among them and she is still not certain whether she wants a life with the prince or her former wish to marry Aspen and live in poverty as a six. There are eight cast levels and who you are is determined by your cast. The king, queen, and prince are, of course, ones. America was a five when she arrived at the castle. During this book, a reb rebels attack the castle more than once, and America is trying to understand what they want and why they want it, along with all the duties and tests assigned to them for the competition. So this is kind of the bachelor um, as prince and mm. learning more about the country's past history that they didn't know. Reached by Ali Condi is the third and final book in the Matched Trilogy. Kasia, Kai, and Xander each contribute to the rebellion against the society as they worry and wonder how the others are doing. A terrible illness is spreading and soon it seems no one can stop it, not the society and not the rebellion. As people struggle for their freedom to choose, some begin to wonder if things will ever really get better. Game by Barry Liga. This is the sequel to I Hunt Killers. The New York Police Department asks Jazz to go to New York to help try to catch the hat dog killer, named for the marks he makes on his victims. Billy Dent, Jazz's serial killer father, has escaped from pr prison and is playing mind games again. I, Jazz continues to hope he will not become a killer too, reminding himself that people are real, people matter. This is creepy and gory like the first book, and I have to give you a warning, there's a cliffhanger ending. <laughs> Maybe you didn't want to know that. But... Well, you'll I'll tell what it is, so. Uh, no. <laughs> I also have heard that the movie rights have been sold for the first book, I Hunt Killers. So oh. there's going to be interest in this mm. series. This is Not a Drill by Beck, Mc... Beck McDowell. Emery and Jake, high school seniors, visit a first grade class three mornings a week to teach French. On this morning, a distraught father comes into the room to take his son home. There is soon a horrible situation because the teacher has refused that because he hasn't gotten permission. And they discover that the father has recently returned from Iraq, is suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, has a gun, and is willing to use it. The teens do their best to keep the children calm and think of a way to calm the father. Tense and hard to read at times, this title gives a sense of what it could be like to be in such a situation. Not a Dropped Drink by Mindy McGinnis. 16-year-old um, Lynn will do anything to protect her valuable water source. But the arrival of new neighbors forces her to reconsider her attitudes. She has been taught by her mother, who, who told her all along, don't let anyone or anything get to the water, the little pond they have there. And they spend a lot of time up on top of the house looking down. And they do. They kill any animal or any person that tries to get to the water because mm -hmm. that is survival. The first line in the book is, Lynn was nine the first time she killed to defend the pond. And like that sentence means she killed a person. Mm. But it really shows a change from the things that her mother had taught her, the way she was raised after her mother was accidentally killed. And these people show up and they need help. Slowly she begins to change to try and find a new way of survival. The 100 by Cass Morgan. The last humans have been orbiting Earth for many years in a space station type home. In this place, breaking the rules is a criminal activity. Now the Chancellor has decided that 100 teens being held in confinement, many of them age 17, will be dropped to Earth to hopefully survive and send back data to prove that life, that Earth is livable again. Shades of a penal colony crossed with Lord of the Flies. I understand this has already been selected by the CW to create a TV series. There I are. can see them doing that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it does say right there, coming soon. Oh, yeah. coming soon. I guess it's not a rumor. <laughs> All the Right Stuff by Walter Dean Myers. Um, Paul, 16, is working in a Harlem soup kitchen the summer after his father was killed in a random shooting. He hasn't seen his father in a long time, but he's still working through the loss, where he listens to lessons about the social contract from Elijah, who is an elderly African-American man. 
Um, Paul also mentors a 17-year-old unwed mother who wants to make it to college on a basketball scholarship. And this book um, is heavy on the social contract side of the story, but the characters and the discussion that Paul has with Elijah really carry the story forward, and it doesn't feel too heavy or too mired in, in things to think about. Mm -hmm. I like the way Elijah, when Paul asks Elijah a question, Elijah will usually say, hmm, think about it and we'll talk tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And then Paul works through some things over the night. It's a fascinating, and it's a short book, but it's a look at things that maybe people haven't thought about very much lately. Another book by Walter Dean Myers is Invasion. Invasion, May 1944, Josiah Wedgwood, called Woody at 19, is at the 29th Infantry preparing for Omaha Beach. They joke about how the journal, Germans will run from them and they'll be going home by October. However, of course, it is horrendous. Men die everywhere. Woody and the 29th continue across France, thinking of home when not fighting. He happens across a friend from home, Marcus Perry, who is black and drives a supply truck. Segregation in the army is not a main focus of the book, but it is there. There is some language and talk of sex included and certainly should be expected in a book about World War II or any war. This was written to accompany his two titles, Fallen Angels and Sunrise Over Fallujah, to kind of round out his war stories. Eleanor and Park by Rainbow Rowell has alternating viewpoints of Eleanor and Park, short sections of each after the opening chapters as they develop from a grudging acceptance to friendship and then to romance. And this is kind of a tough book because they both faced bullying. Eleanor, because she is, is larger, with red hair and she gets bullying at school and she's she's getting a different kind of bullying at home from her stepfather. Park is um, Asian American and he gets bullying for that as well but both of them really work hard to not let that affect them and to keep going forward to the things that they want to accomplish. Fangirl also by Rainbow Rowell talks about twin sisters from Omaha fans of the Simon Snow book series they are starting their freshman year at UNL, but will live separately for the first time. One, Kath, is having trouble adjusting. Ren is a sister who pushed for the change, and Kath feels like a fish out of water. She turns to the fan fiction she and Ren wrote together for two years, and now is writing alone. It is the one familiar place for her, and uh, she's really faltering. Winger by Andrew Smith. There is a reason everyone has been talking about this book. Ryan Dean West is a 14-year-old junior at Pine Mountain Boarding School. He is intelligent and excruciatingly immature. He is a starter at wing on the rugby team, hence his nickname, Winger. And though scrawny and thin, he throws himself into the game. We hear his inner monologue, where his thoughts often end with, I am such a loser. But we also see his yearning for Annie, two years his senior, and his friendship with Joey, team captain who was gay and open about it. There is, as School Library Journal noted, drinking, profanity, crudeness, and constant verbal slurs. There is also heart, humor, and pluck, along with a heartbreaking conclusion. The Dream Thieves by Maggie Stiefhofer is book two of the Raven Cycle, and um, things are beginning to escalate in Cave's Water. Ronan Lynch's ability to pull objects from his dreams is almost out of control, but the most concerning thing is that the mysterious Gray Man is stalking the Lynch family, looking for something called the Gray Warren. And again, this is a middle book. I think there's going to be three in this series, so you have the middle book issues of pulling the, the story forward without really a conclusion, but it's an excellent read. Rose Under Fire by Elizabeth Wine. I got started on this book and had to take it back to the library, and then I haven't gotten it back again. Oh. But it, it is excellent. It's a companion book to Code Name Verity, which I read completely mm. and thoroughly enjoyed. In this book, the main character is Rose Justice, an American, and her job is to ferry Allied planes from England to Paris. And it describes her job and the, the dangers involved. And about a third of the way through the book, she gets captured. And she is sent to Ravensbrück, the notorious women's concentration camp in northern Germany. And there she encounters the Polish women who are being experimented on with medical experimentations. 
and their efforts to survive all of this. Um, so it's it's uh, different from the first book as, uh, as far as I've read, but it's still about something that you don't read about very much and also about being strong and surviving. The Fifth Wave by Rick Yancey. In this book, they note that alien invasions are not like the movies. They don't like come down in their spaceship and you wave at them and they wave back. <laughs> The first wave was lights out, no power, no more electricity. The second wave they call surf's up because that was tsunamis everywhere. The third wave was, well, I don't want to give everything away, but we're down to them wondering, will there be a fifth wave? And if there is, what will it be? Because there aren't that many humans left. Cassie is 16, and she promised her brother Sammy that she would find him, and she will keep that promise. We can't trust anyone who was left. They might actually be one of the others, aliens. Boy Nobody by Alan Zadoff. He is 16, and 16, his name changes with each assignment. He was brought into the fold at age 12 when his father died, and he was taught what he needed to know, and now he does his job. He gets close to someone he needs to, usually at the new school, and then that friendship gets him close to his target, he kills his target, and then he leaves. This time, for the first time, the person he is supposed to get close to, the mayor's daughter, awakens romantic feelings. Can he kill her father? Short chapters, twists, will appeal to readers. It's similar to the first book I was talking about in this section, Nobody, but also they're very different. They're both assassins, but other than that, they're very different. And that's the last book on the list. There are, again, uh, lists of additional titles for the series books, but I mm. thought I didn't hear. No problem, yeah. <laughs> Not okay. that much longer. Than no, that. that's okay. Not a problem. Um, that was great. So, um, nobody had any questions or comments throughout the show, except for, actually, that's not true. Um, uh, Pat, uh, Tasha, who were you asking about earlier? Yeah. Um, Louisville. Here. Uh, yes. I did say thank you for the handout. Oh, so, yes, that good. was very useful. Glad you got it. <laughs> um, so, yes, um, the handout related to this that um, so I was reading from will, will be available afterwards if you didn't get it ahead of time before the show. Um, and the PowerPoint slides will be up if you're interested in seeing this, the, screen, the covers and whatnot with the recording. Um, so thank you very much, Sally, for yeah, coming on you. the show and doing that with us again this year. Um, I always like having you on to do this, and it's usually about this time after the conference in October right. and before the new year starts, because um, I get lots of ideas for Christmas presents. Um, I say this, I think, every year. Um, my cousin has three kids, 8, 10, and an older teenage boy, so I'm always looking for ideas for that. Oh, yes. <laughs> so I've found great ideas here um, over the years to um, do um, for Christmas. So that will wrap us up for today. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Sally. Um, and that wraps up. Yes, for there we go. <laughs> Making sure I saw it Excellent. on the screen there. Um, our best new youth books of 2013. It has been recorded. Will be available later today, tomorrow. Um, so if you weren't able to catch everything, or you want to share or watch it again, um, you'll be able to um, see the recording. Um, we hope you join us next week when our topic is um, Turning Your Library Around Part 2, Four Years Later. Um, a couple of years ago, we had um, staff in the South Sioux City Public Library here in Nebraska come on. They made some huge changes at their library um, and increased their usage and their programming with a very small staff. Um, so they, um, they've um, mixed off the director there, contacted me and wants to give an update on what they've been doing the last since then. So you see Perfect. more new things they've been doing um, there. So I hope you'll sign up um, and join us for that. And if you are on Facebook, uh, Encompass Live is on Facebook as well. So if you're a big Facebook user, please do go there and like us on Facebook. You'll get notifications of when shows are coming up, um, recordings are available, um, when we're starting, like I said this morning. Join us right now. You can log right in on the fly. So if you are a big Facebook user, then go ahead and like us there and keep up to date on what's going on with Encompass Live. Other than that, we are wrapped up for today. Thank you very much for attending, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.